G'day, my name is Brennan Gregg from Oracle. I'm here to give you a quick informal talk on performance instrumentation counters, and I'm joined by... I'm Jim Morrow of Oracle Server Technologies Group. And Rob Bourbonnet uh, of the same group. This is a talk that's, that's, that's difficult to do because uh, the performance instrumentation counters are not really well documented, they're not very inviting for the, the end user. But it's an, an important talk that we'd like to give informally so to help you get started. Uh, the three of us have used these a lot for analysis of performance issues. There's a lot of uh, useful information that you can get out of the performance instrumentation counters for, for performance analysis. But they're also very intimidating. So we want to do a quick informal video where we can chat about our experiences and help anyone get started with this feature. So as means of a quick introduction, Performance instrumentation counters are registers on CPUs, that's how they're usually implemented. Uh, they can give information on what the CPU is doing, such as the number of instructions it's executing, memory stall cycles, I.O. bus transactions. There are some tools that give you visibility into this. They're, in particular, it's useful for ex explaining why you have CPU utilization, to see whether that's due to memory pressure, whether you're talking to buses a lot. So it's, it's also something that since, it's, since there's not a huge amount of documentation for this, not a lot of people have investigated the performance instrumentation counters. They're there on a lot of the systems you have, so it's really worth a look. If you have CPU pressure and you want to get a better understanding of it, maybe that's floating point in mm -hmm. arithmetic that you can, you can examine as well. Uh, so Brenda, you, right, you've made a measurement, right? You, you basically, the starting point, you've made a measurement of, of a performance experiment. Yeah. And, and you don't understand, right? You're just saying, how come I'm going at that speed, right? It's running on CPU, and I thought I'd be going tw you know, twice as fast, and you're not. So let's go see in the CPC or in, the, in, the, in those uh, performance counters, you know, is there a hint of something in the, within the CPU that is getting saturated? And, and that's the key. That, that's really, really important is on, on CPU is the key. Right. Being on CPU if is if, if, if yeah. your CPUs are not heavily utilized, mm -hmm. if if you're using tools like PRStat on Solaris, and they're not showing you that your threads are spending a considerable amount of time executing on C, uh, on CPU, then this isn't the tool set you yeah. need. You need to go open another section of the toolbox. So here, you know, we got here because we're on CPU, and as Rock indicated, we're executing on CPU, and maybe we're still not meeting our performance expectations. And we want to get a sense for how efficiently are our threads executing uh, on the core of the microprocessor. Yeah. yeah. And another point you mentioned in the introduction, there's a number of, of registers, right, that, in which you store those, those uh, CPU counters. And one thing people need to know, right, there's a number of counters, and then they can count a lot of events, right? There's like hundreds of possible yeah. events. So the thing is, you are programming the different registers to be counting among a, a, a big set of events. You have a small set of registers and a big set of possible events. You are programming them. And, and the difficulty, I, I think, uh, in, in the, in the, when you're trying, often you want to correlate two different uh, counters. Yep. Um, and they're not always possibly programmable at the same time. Uh, let's say register A can count this, but when he's counting this kind of event, register B can only count this subset of event. So you, you see all these possibilities, and, and not everything is available to you at the same time, which makes it, you know, already it's a little bit involved to get started. Right. That's right, and, and since they're register-based, you can't have multiple users reading different counts at the same time for the same reason. It's, it's, it's caveats like this that make getting started with these counters quite intimidating and confusing, which is exactly why we wanted to have a quick informal talk. Right. And another reason um, why, why we want to encourage people to check these out is that if you're looking at a system that has high CPU utilization, the response from many people is to buy faster CPUs or more CPUs. That often doesn't help uh, if, your, if your workload is uh, memory bus saturated buying faster CPUs is not going to help because you'll just stall on CPU, on, on memory stall cycles uh, quicker. Uh, maybe doing floating point arithmetic, maybe that's actually the problem. So any situation where you've got CPU, high CPU utilization, 
There's more that you can do apart from just buying more CPUs or faster CPUs. You can use this information to tease apart why the CPUs are utilized. It's, it's not just because you're doing lots of code. Uh, there, there are other aspects of the CPU you can measure and, and learn about. So I've written up just a list of talking points that, that we can go through. The first is on Solaris, there are a couple of tools which we use to measure uh, performance instrumentation counters. So to start with, they're a bit weird. We've already mentioned that. Right. Uh, you can only measure a certain number of performance instrumentation counters at the same time, even though there may be hundreds of different statistics available, they call them events. And also, when one user is programming those registers to monitor various statistics, other users can't do it at the same time. You need to be root, usually, to or have the right privilege to look at the performance instrumentation counters. The two tools we've got in Solaris, we've got CPU stack, so that you can look at system-wide uh, performance instrumentation counters, and CPU track, which I don't use that often, that's so you can latch onto a particular right. process. Um, and and look at uh, the, the counters as they increment in the context of that process. So I think just before you dig down further on the list, one, one of the things that people first starting to use these tools get intimidated by is they type CPU track or CPU stat dash H and, it's and they get the help. <laughs> and what that will do is that will give you a list of all the events that you can program these counters for. Uh, these counters for. And the, the, the events tend to have very, very cryptic names to them, right? And so sometimes you see something like L2 underscore miss and say, okay, that's an L2 cache miss. And some of them you can in infer what they are, but a lot of them you cannot. They're, they're very cryptic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I think you indicate up there, the, the only way to understand what these events are is to go to the website of, you know, the vendor that, that built the microprocessor, download the programmer's reference manual, and start reading. Mm -hmm. um, so some folks kind of get a little bit intimidated by that. And some mm -hmm. of the newer processors, too, have quite a few events. You know, they, they, they tend to give you, you know, quite a few quite different good. events. So that's something, as, as a new user, you want to be cognizant of. Mm -hmm. don't, don't let that, you know, yeah. deter you from forging ahead with CPU stat and CPU track. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something that we can, we can explain easily in an informal talk. It's hard to get started. Uh, and, and Jim's right, you, on Solaris, in fact, if you type CPU stat minus H, not only will it list the available events, but I think in most, most uh, times we compile a binary, it'll actually tell you which manual to go out and fetch and read, whether that's an UltraSpark user guide or a kernel and BIOS developer's manual. Um, so, so you'll be going to one of the, the manufacturer's websites, getting this manual, which is probably going to be 500 pages long, going near the end of the manual, which uh, <laughs> will be like chapter 20, will be a huge, like, almost, like, sometimes an appendix. Right. And there's not a lot of expl explanation. There's certainly um, almost no explanation yeah. on what's interesting, no guidance. Yeah. It's just this appendix listing of all these different counters. Because a lot of counters are put there for the CPU designers. Right. Yeah, that's right. They, 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 count as but they end up as very useful right. to us. Yeah, so, that's a good point. Yeah. So, so yeah, the counters are there for the, the manufacturers so they can check things. And also, you know, even once you think you've understood uh, the, the meaning of a, a counter, you know, you still have to be very critical of the experiments you're running and then take a step back because they're not necessarily accurately representation yeah. of the, if it's a cache miss, you know, sometimes, it's going to be cash misses, but maybe 100x more or less than yeah. the actual, the relative values of the, the counters are very interesting to, to look at. Well, this gets, to, this gets to a general methodology that I've heard Brendan preach actually many, many times when he does his performance talk is, when you have the opportunity, do a controlled experiment. Acquaint yourself with the tools yes. through the use of a, a controlled experiment. And you know, you use disk I.O. and network I.O. We actually know what the load should look like so you can verify that the tools are giving you what you think they're giving you. The same applies to CPU, uh, stat CPU track as well. If you, get, you know, if you have a small type piece of code, you know your data set should fit in the cache line, exactly. that kind of thing, yeah. then those kinds of controlled experiments uh, where you're running a piece of known code and have a sense for what, uh, what these counters should be returning to you can you know, give you a lot more confidence in, in, in using them and the, the interpretation. and the interpretation of the data. Yeah, yeah. and, and that, that's right. I, I have learned a lot of these, these counters by writing a little C program that may do a lot of uh, arithmetic or it may do a lot of memory loads and stores. To be really good 
with this, what you actually want to do is when you compile it, do cc minus cap s to dump out the assembly, and then you can tweak the assembly. Uh, because sometimes you'll optimize out what you think it's doing. Right. Uh, and it's really the assembly that what's, what gets executed. Don't get too intimidated. I'm, I'm not saying like write brain assembly program. I'm saying take an assembly output and just yeah. cut and paste something a bunch of times. You're creating um, an experiment which gives you an expectation of what the counters should come out to. Yes. Right? Yeah. Right? And presumably when you run these things, you're binding them on CPU and stuff like that, right? Or, or do you not do uh, So that gets, it actually, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, that gets to another good point about the use of these tools is um, um, you, you oftentimes have to isolate the thing you're measuring on a CPU so there's no interference from other threads getting scheduled on that CPU. Yeah. And that's kind of part of the methodology. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the methodology and we'll probably get into that more. So yeah, that, that's one of the difficulties with this is you might hear us talk about all this value you can get out of CPU. Uh, the performance instrumentation counters for understanding CPU workloads. And when you start, you have all this homework ahead of you. You have to go and read the manual, maybe write some little programs so that you can test out the statistics. That's the way things are at the moment. Um, I, I did take a swing a number of years ago at making this easier by writing a toolkit called the Cache Kit. Um, in the Cache Kit, it's, on, it's on, my, on my website, I wrote a little, uh, I forget what it's, Perl or Org programs to post-process the output of CPU counters just to make it a bit more user friendly. So you had some um, already cooked scripts to run and will give you various metrics of interest. But I haven't updated that for a while and there's been a lot of CPU revisions and that's one of the difficulties is it's very dependent on the CPU type. So More precisely, just, just so everybody's clear about this, it's different from CPU to CPU to CPU. Different CPU types are gonna have different counters, so. Yeah. Um, you know, unless you're looking at the exact same microprocessor right. on system A and system B and system C. And generation of CPU. Yeah. Right? So yeah, if, if you look at them and you think, this is really hard, this is so much work to uh, understand what the cryptic, what the cryptic uh, counters mean, understand which ones are useful to look at to start with, why hasn't someone written some good tools on this? That's the, that's, that's the world of, of yeah. performance instrumentation counters right now, and it may get, get better in the future. There's no standard for this, so CPU manufacturers can't um, export a set of uh, performance instrumentation counters that adhere to a well-documented standard that has been designed to be helpful. There's sort of one, because John Haslam did use something for the D-Trace CPC provider, so... For, for the major, like, cache misses yeah, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, technologies, the they're, they're starting to be a naming convention that are, are starting to, to pop up and are used by the analyzer uh, part of the tools. That's right. So, um, uh, analyzers, uh, developer environments, uh, Dtrace now has, uh, if you're on the right version of, of OpenSlice, now has access to these counters. And um, you can look at, you can see the documentation on the Dtrace wiki uh, that was written by John Haslam. And it does use some of the standard naming conventions, which is making life a lot easier for people to get started in this space. Because yeah. rather than just some cryptic name, there's some sort of standard so that you can actually find L2 cache misses quickly and things like that. Uh, yep. So that's the um, so that's to start talking about CPU stat and CPU track. Um, you will have to go and fetch the manual and start reading through that. Uh, the Dtrace CPC provider, just to mention that Dtrace uh, is a troubleshooting, not just a troubleshooting tool, but it's a, a, a tracing tool that's available on many different operating systems at the moment. It's on Solaris, it's on Mac OS X, uh, and... FreeBSD. FreeBSD, mm -hmm. and it's... Dynamic. It's dynamic. <laughs> it, it, it lets you instrument and examine all sorts of software. I, there may be some people watching this video, video who haven't seen Dtrace, but hopefully a lot of people have by now. Uh, since Dtrace can see all of software, it's actually quite valuable for Dtrace to see the performance instrumentation counters as well, because it can actually solve a long-standing problem which analyzers and development and developer environments took a swing at, and that is, for example, uh, one of the interesting things from PIX is L2 cache misses. So on your CPU, you've got different layers of cache for memory access. Your level two cache, once you miss out of that, it's usually an expensive operation to go out and fetch data from memory. So L2 cache misses, if you've written some code that's doing a lot of them, you're causing memory pressure, 
And with the Dtrace CPC provider, you can find out where in your user code you are doing L2 cache misses. That will help the developer tune their code so that it runs better on the architecture. Yep. Yep. So that was just one thing. And there's lots of other things that the Dtrace CPC provider can help with. And there are some examples on that wiki. But it's yet another place where you can access these as well. To get started, so, so you're interested, you have uh, CPU pressure, you're interested in understanding more about it. The very first metric I would get people to look at is the cycles per instruction. Sometimes people write this as instructions per cycle. It doesn't really matter. Right. Cycles per instruction, what that is, is how many CPU cycles did it take on average to execute an instruction? Why this is useful? Why is this useful, Jim? OK, so this is useful because uh, many, many, many workloads. Um, when people look at the architecture of high-end microprocessors and they read all about the bells and whistles and they say, oh, this microprocessor is awesome. We have multiple integer units. We have speculative execution. We have branch prediction. We have a floating point unit. We can execute four instructions every clock cycle. So they expect that they're just going to get the super scale of performance and be executing not one, not two, but multiple instructions per clock cycle. In reality, most workloads don't do this. In reality, most workloads, when they get placed on top of the microprocessor pop pipeline, uh, they stall. They stall waiting for data. They stall waiting for instructions. And this is where CPI comes in. Clocks per instruction, as Brendan said, is the number of clock cycles per instruction. Um, a CPI value of one would mean that for every clock cycle, we executed one instruction which doesn't actually sound that good after you read the, the glossy brochure about the microprocessor, but it's actually a very, very good number to get on a real world workload. In, uh, in an ideal situation, um, you could get a CPI value less than one, which would mean that I'm actually able to execute multiple instructions per clock cycle, which is what all the microprocessor designers tell you your workload's gonna do. But in reality, as I said, most workloads tend to stall waiting for data from the cache. Um, and that's when you end up with CPI values that are greater than one. CPI of two means two clock cycles, one instruction, not so great. CPI of four, four clock cycles, one instruction. So that means, what am I doing with those other three clock cycles? Mm -hmm. I'm not getting, and I'm not, not so advancing great. work. Okay, okay. Not, not so great, it's also very relative. In, in some environment, you know, a, a CPI of two, three, four will be the norm, right? And if you're, if you're manipulating a lot of memory, you, you do have to expect some stall, a level of stall. So you're really looking at relative merits of, of, you know, I'm used to running at four cycles per instruction, and today I'm at 15. Yeah, that, that is really the kind of that, Yeah, that's a good point, Rod, right? yeah. Yeah, you're looking at, yeah. So I used uh, CPI2, and I, and I did blog about this. It identified our key bottleneck on the, the Oracle Sun Storage appliance before we shipped. And that was, um, we were, since it's a storage appliance, it's moving data from, say, the network port to the SAS HPAs and vice versa. It's doing a lot of memory I.O. And um, the CPI, when I first measured it, was over 10. So on average, um, it took 10 CPU cycles per um, instruction. A lot, of memory a lot of memory stall there. To get my head around CPI, I did write some test programs. I tweaked the assembly. So I had one that just did arithmetic. And I was able to get the CPI down to 0 0.34. Uh, and I did one that just did a whole heap of memory loads and stores. Yeah, really. And the CPI was, was blowing out 5, 10, and higher. So if you're able to measure CPI, it gives you, it, it's probably the first thing you want to check out from the pigs, because it gives you uh, that idea of whether I'm code bound, I'm just executing a lot of code if that number's low, or if I'm memory bound if that number is high. Or I'm, I might be stalling on other, other events as well which you can exactly. drill down further with CPU stat. Might not just be memory, it might be other stuff. Exactly, so when you have a high CPI, right, you're looking, you might have a problem, which is not necessary, but you really want to know what kind of event are you stalling on, and then you go and use those other counters, because there's a lot of counters that count different ty style of stalls. Yeah. And, and right. so by identifying what kind of stall you have, then you, you, you really have a good, you know, first starting point to yeah. say, what is my problem? I mean, probably 80% of it's gonna be cache stalls. But, yeah, but you're, L1, you're right, L2, sure. LTLBs, data, right. instruction, right. Uh, so yeah, iCache. Yeah. Yep. So that, that, that's a good point. And um, you're right, it's the first place to check. It will help you identify a problem. You can then drill down. There's one stall type I haven't found yet, but I've been trying to um, encourage it. That's thermal stalls. Oh. 
where the CPU will slow down because it's getting too hot. Interesting. Uh, but I'd like to come up with a cool way to uh, bring your hair dryer to work. Bring my hair dryer to work and stick it on. Yeah. That, that's not so, really so the, okay. Grass counter exists in, in my. In yeah, yeah. It, 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 the, there are thermal counters okay. in the CPUs. Um, so yeah, check out vibrational styles. No? Vibrational styles. Yell at it. You can try yelling at it. So yeah, these are a list in the CPU user and developer manual. Um, and look for things like stall cycles if you've got a high CPI. It will explain what's going on. And I am happy that uh, I did mention CPI in the Solaris Performance and Tools book uh, because uh, if, if you haven't seen it, we go through a lot of different performance analysis for Solaris. And uh, I mentioned it's just three shots. First edition. First edition. But of course, the one liner I've got in there, you're going to have to adapt for your CPU type. Every CPU is different.